Hmm. What if God called you on the phone with an important message about your life? And someone else took the message. Hello? How important would it be for that person to get the details right? God said that you are going to fall in love someday. <laughs> yeah. But you can never have sex or get married. Or no, 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 no. You can never fall in love or have sex or get married. Or was it you can't fall in love? You can fall in love, but you can't have sex until you get married. Anyway, it was something like that. Would you be satisfied with just the general gist of the message? Basically, the gist of it? You. Sex. No. You'd want the details, right? You'd want all the nuance. This is your life we're talking about. It's not just a yes or no question. So why is it that when we talk about the Bible and homosexuality, we treat it like a yes or no question and gloss over all the nuance? Brothers and sisters, the Bible is clear. Homosexuality, no. So don't be gay. But if you are gay, just don't be. But if you are, don't say gay, say same-sex attracted and get some therapy so you won't be. But if you still are, it's simple. Man should not lie with man. So don't have sex or get married or fall in love or hold hands or anything in the category of homosexuality. You know, like um, being gay. It's not enough to just say that the Bible does or doesn't condemn homosexuality as a broad concept. For me, as a gay Christian, the question is much more nuanced. I want to know how to live my life in a way that pleases God, and that's not about sex. Let's take a nuanced look at the Bible and homosexuality from the perspective of someone whose life this is actually about. Growing up, my understanding of this wasn't nuanced at all. I thought people just chose to be gay and that it was a sinful choice. As a devout evangelical, I never would have chosen to be gay. When I realized as a teenager that I was attracted to guys and not girls, I thought it was a phase I could grow out of. And when that didn't happen, I thought if I prayed about it and trusted Christ and had enough faith and got the right therapy and never acted on my feelings, that eventually God would make me straight. I called myself straight, even though I wasn't. I dated girls, even though I wasn't attracted to them. And I went to Christian groups called Ex-Gay Ministries, where I met lots and lots of miserable people desperately trying to change their orientation for God. But it wasn't working. I saw so many people end up hating themselves when their orientation didn't change, lonely and depressed, while their Christian friends back home kept thinking it was a choice and that they were rebelling against Jesus. I wrote a book about this. It's called Torn, Rescuing the Gospel from the Gays versus Christians Debate. Now, today, the majority of Christians have come to realize that sexual orientation isn't just a choice. And much of the ex-gay movement has collapsed as so many of the leaders who once claimed God had made them straight have since admitted that it wasn't true. Even many of the most conservative churches are recognizing that some people are just always going to be attracted to the same sex and not the opposite sex. In other words, gay. But even with that realization, in many churches, the conversation still isn't very nuanced when it comes to what the Bible says to those people. Basically, the gist of it, you, sex, no. Many churches, Christian colleges, and other organizations have focused on taking a position against same-sex sex, treating a gay or bi person's experiences merely a sexual temptation. I understand the intent, but when I realized I was gay, the big questions on my mind weren't about sex. They were about my future, about love and romance and companionship and loneliness and how I could live and what my purpose was. So when the church treats gay and bi folks or anyone in the LGBT community as if the only thing that matters about our experience is sex, and specifically not having it, it's dehumanizing. A biblical approach that stops at sex is worse than useless to gay and bi Christians. Catholic writer Eve Tushnet, who is herself celibate, put it this way, 
Right now, gay young people mostly hear a catechism of silence. Not about church teaching on gay marriage or homosexual acts, about which they're wincingly aware, but about their futures. You can't have a vocation of not gay marrying and not having sex. You can't have a vocation of no. So as we turn to the Bible on this, we need to make sure we're asking a nuanced question. Instead of just asking if the Bible has a yes or no position on homosexuality, let's begin by asking what the Bible says to someone like me. Given that I'm gay, how should I live as a Christian? What might my future look like? To answer this question, we have to look deeper than just passages about sex. We need serious Bible study. Because when I read the Bible, there's no passage saying, if you're a gay Christian, here's what you should do. So what can I learn from what the Bible does say? First, it's clear from the beginning that God designed human beings to be in relationship. In Genesis, after creating the world and seeing that each part of it is good, God creates the first person, Adam, and says that something is not good. It is not good that the man should be alone. Now notice, God doesn't say, yo, Adam, I'm sufficient for you. God recognizes Adam needs human companionship. So God makes Eve, someone of his own flesh, to be his life partner. This human longing for companionship is a common theme throughout Scripture, and not just any person will do. When Jacob falls for Rachel, but is tricked into marrying Leah instead, he works another seven years for the chance to marry Rachel, because he wanted somebody not just some body. He wanted to be with the person he loved. And we see throughout the Bible that this matters to God. That companionship, that marriage bond matters to God. Yeah, there are some people who thrive in singleness and solitude. We're all different. But even the Apostle Paul, who himself felt a call to celibacy, recognized that it was unrealistic and inappropriate to try to force that calling onto everyone. He wrote, I wish that all were as I myself am, but each has their own gift from God. It is better to marry than to burn with passion. Paul saw celibacy as a higher calling than marriage, but even Paul didn't think everyone was cut out for celibacy. Okay, but what does that mean for me? I mean, same-sex marriage wasn't part of the cultures where the Bible was written, and sexual orientation is never explicitly discussed. Well. As we've grown to understand more about sexual orientation from research and listening to each other's stories, Christians around the world have been wrestling with how that informs our application of scripture to these modern day questions. Many Christians argue that no one should be excluded from marriage. So then the most compassionate approach is to apply the same biblical marriage standards to everyone, making allowances for orientation, so that same-sex couples are held to the same standards as opposite-sex ones. These Christians point out that there's evidence all around us of same-sex couples whose relationships are bearing the same kind of good fruit we see in healthy heterosexual relationships. But other Christians argue that marriage needs to remain a heterosexual institution, not just because those are the examples we have in Scripture, but because every explicit mention of same-sex sexual behavior in the Bible is negative. And that's true. There are a handful of those passages, and LGBT people sometimes call them the clobber passages, feeling that they've been used too often as weapons. So what are these so-called clobber passages? The first of them is the Sodom story in Genesis 19, where two angels visiting Lot are threatened with gang rape by an angry mob. That single threat, by the way, is what gave rise to the misconception that Sodom was a gay city, even though the text says no such thing. Then in Judges 19, a similar story in Gibeah has townspeople, again, threatening a foreign traveler with gang rape. But in this case, they end up raping and murdering his concubine instead, a woman. In Leviticus 18 to 20, Moses gives the Israelites a list of rules to separate them from nearby cultures, including some rules Christians follow today and some we don't. One of those rules is, do not lie with a man as with a woman, which many scholars believe references the widespread male temple prostitution at the time. In Romans 1, Paul describes people who turned from God to worship idols and engaged in lascivious sex acts as a result. Again, possibly a reference to temple prostitution and related sex rites. 
He describes these people as inflamed with lusts and enmeshed in all kinds of sin. Although, ironically, his ultimate point here is to remind his audience not to point fingers because they are just as sinful. And finally, in two passages, Paul refers to two sinful groups, the Arsenokoitai and the Malakoi, but without giving us much context for who they were. The structure of the word Arsenokoitai suggests some kind of male-male sexual behavior, but scholars are fiercely divided on who exactly these people were and what it was Paul was critiquing. And that creates a lot of confusion for people trying to make sense of these passages. For example, growing up, I read the popular NIV translation of the Bible, which variously translated these words as perverts, homosexual offenders, and male prostitutes. But following a rise in the visibility of gay Christians and a backlash among some conservative Christians, the NIV retranslated these words to condemn men who have sex with men. Someone picking up an NIV Bible for the first time today wouldn't know that it hadn't been translated that way before 2011. Still. Each of these six passages mentions some form of sinful same-sex sexual behavior. And I've just skimmed the surface of these passages. There's plenty to discuss about all six of them. But it's unfortunate that when Christians talk about homosexuality and the Bible, we spend almost all of our time arguing about just these passages. Because if you've been paying attention, you've hopefully noticed something important. None of these passages actually answers our nuanced question about how a gay Christian like me should live, or, or what my future could be. I mean, here are stories of attempted gang rape and orgies in idol worship, but there's nothing here about people like me living out their years one way or another. I mean, there are no stories of how Adam and Steve were happily married, but there are also no stories of how Adam and Steve were in love but had to keep their distance because God said so or how God decreed that Steve had to live out his life alone. Like so many other issues we face today, sexual orientation is just never discussed in the Bible. And people on both sides will try to argue that the Bible's silence on that point is automatic evidence for their side, but it's not that simple. So we're left trying to make arguments about love and relationships and people's futures on the basis of a handful of passages that aren't really about those things. When you're gay, it's so frustrating to hear people tell you that a passage about gang rape is supposed to answer your question about loneliness and whether you can ever fall in love. Not even sex, just love. One of the big challenges of Bible interpretation is that you always have to consider context. Not only the context of a passage within the Bible itself, but also the historical and cultural context. When the New Testament speaks negatively of tax collectors, it's not that tax collecting itself is sinful. It's about the sinful practices that tax collectors of that time were known for. But if you don't know that context, if you don't know about the historical practices of tax collectors in Jesus' time, it would be easy to misunderstand what the Bible is saying. Christian theologians have an old adage about this. A text without a context is a pretext for a proof text. In other words, you can't properly interpret a Bible passage without knowing the context. For instance, when the Israelite men are told in Leviticus not to lie with other men, they're also forbidden to get tattoos, cut their hair, or shave. Later in the New Testament, Paul requires women to wear head coverings and requires men to have short hair. But most Christian theologians agree that these rules are tied to specific contexts. The significance of long hair for Paul, or tattoos for the Israelites, was very different from the significance of those things today. And tattoos, for instance, had a religious significance in that culture. They weren't just decoration. And that understanding helps us interpret those passages. So if we're going to be consistent in our biblical interpretation, we need to consider context with these passages just as much as we do with all the others. What type of same-sex behavior was being practiced at the time? What was its cultural significance? What points were these passages trying to make in context, and how do we apply that to our situation today? Is there a difference between gang rape or lusts out of control and two people who want to commit their lives to each other? And if so, how does that affect our answer to the question about a gay Christian's future? I mean, this is Bible Interpretation 101. Christians do this all the time, and yet 
on this one topic, some Christians are reluctant to use the same standards they'd use to interpret any other passage. Instead, they stick with a surface reading that we wouldn't settle for anywhere else. I think part of the reason is that many people still think being gay is really just about sex, and they don't want to be seen as loosening standards on sexual immorality. So they draw a line in the sand using a broad term like homosexuality, and they end up condemning not only same-sex sex, but also same-sex romance, and sometimes even just people admitting that they're gay or bi. Gay and bi Christians then find ourselves marginalized and misunderstood, and we end up in a weird place where compassion is being pitted against scripture, which isn't how this is supposed to work. Anytime compassion and scripture seem to be pulling in opposite directions, that's a pretty big red flag that something somewhere has gone horribly wrong. History has taught us that's a flag we can't ignore. A century and a half ago, Christians in the United States were similarly divided over another big issue, slavery. There were clear Bible passages that seemed to explicitly allow slavery, and yet many Christians seemed to know instinctively that that couldn't possibly be right. Now, there were, of course, slaveholders who were happy to cite scripture to justify what they already wanted to believe. But I'm not talking about them. If you read the writings of the time, you'll find that there were also devout Christians who were deeply disturbed by slavery and very much wanted to oppose it, and yet they were afraid to do so because they couldn't get past what seemed to be the clear, consistent witness of scripture. In 1846, Leonard Bacon wrote, the evidence that there were both slaves and masters of slaves in the churches founded and directed by the apostles cannot be got rid of without resorting to methods of interpretation which will get rid of everything. Likewise, respected Bible scholar Moses Stewart wrote in 1850 that those who wanted to abolish slavery, quote, must give up the New Testament authority or abandon the fiery course which they are pursuing. Now again, he did not like American slavery but he didn't believe abolition could be reconciled with scripture. Church historian Mark Knoll has written about this in his book, The Civil War as a Theological Crisis. And it's easy to understand how the slavery debate was like the sexuality debate today, something of a theological crisis. It seemed to be compassion versus scripture. As Knoll puts it, by defining slaveholding as a basic evil, whatever the Bible might say about it, Radical abolitionists frightened away from anti-slavery, many moderates who had also grown troubled with slavery, but who were not willing to give up loyalty to scripture. See, a common argument of the day was that even if slavery seemed wrong to you and abolitionism seemed right, you couldn't trust that feeling because it was based on culture and human reasoning, not on the Bible, and people's hearts can be deceived. Henry Van Dyke preached this in 1860. The tree of abolitionism is evil and only evil. It springs from and is nourished by an utter rejection of the scriptures. It does not try slavery by the Bible. It tries the Bible by the principles of freedom. True belief says, speak, Lord, thy servant waits to hear. Abolitionism says, speak, Lord, but speak in accordance with the principles of human nature, or they cannot be received by the great mass of mankind as a divine revelation. Ooh. Now you might be thinking, wait, isn't there a biblical case for abolishing slavery? Of course there is, and I think it's a strong one. The entire New Testament is built on the idea that the spirit of the law wins out over the letter of the law. In this case, the letter of the law allows for practices that were common when the Bible was written, but the spirit of the law pushes clearly and consistently toward greater grace and mercy and equality and freedom and love. This is incredibly clear to us today. Attempting to make a biblical case for slavery would require putting the letter of the law above the spirit of the law, which the New Testament repeatedly reminds us not to do. The clear thrust of scripture is toward freedom and equality. But even though this is obvious to us today, Christian abolitionists who made this argument at the time were widely viewed as heretics on a slippery slope to throwing out the Bible. As Knoll explains, nuanced biblical attacks on American slavery faced rough going precisely because they were nuanced. This position, the, the abolitionist position, 
could not simply be read out of any one biblical text. It could not be lifted directly from the page. Rather, it needed patient reflection on the entirety of the scriptures. It required expert knowledge of the historical circumstances of ancient Near Eastern and Roman slave systems, and it demanded that sophisticated interpretive practice replace a commonsensical literal approach to the sacred text. It was far easier to just point to these texts and say, look, there it is in black and white, the Bible says it, that settles it. But in cases like these, the simple answer isn't always the right answer. Good Christian theology requires nuance. It's important that we read and interpret the Bible in context, and it's important that we check our interpretation by looking at the fruit it bears in the lives of real people. Good theology, good biblical interpretation, should always bear good fruit. If it doesn't, that's a sign that you may need to prayerfully recheck your interpretation. And that's not a new idea. This is how Jesus taught us to interpret and apply the scriptures. Just look at the Sabbath controversy in the New Testament. For Jesus and his contemporaries, one of the most important scriptural laws was the Sabbath law. From sundown on Friday to sundown on Saturday, you weren't supposed to do any work. So when Jesus healed a man's hand on the Sabbath, it was a big deal. Other religious leaders were outraged. How could Jesus justify breaking the Sabbath law? Now, if I had been Jesus, I probably would have just said, well, you know, healing doesn't count as work. I'm, I'm Jesus. Healing comes easy for me. It's not work. But Jesus made a very different argument. He said, which is lawful on the Sabbath? To do good or to do evil? To save life or to kill? Okay, this is kind of a weird argument. Jesus wasn't saving the guy's life. He just healed his hand. And the alternative wasn't to kill him. He could have just not healed it or healed it another day. But Jesus' point here seems to be that doing what's right requires looking beyond just the letter of the law, because the real-world impact of our actions matters. And he gives him examples of this, like, if one of you has a son or an ox that falls into a well on the Sabbath day, will you not immediately pull him out? Essentially, Jesus is saying, okay, you want a clear example of work on the Sabbath? How about pulling a child or an ox out of a well? That's work. No one's going to argue about whether that's work, and work is forbidden on the Sabbath, right? But wouldn't you do it anyway? Or are you really going to let your child sit in a well overnight? In other words, the rule is important, but God cares about people more than rules. The impact on real people matters. Or, as Jesus puts it, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Put another way, the law was made for people. People weren't made for the law. And although Jesus uses the Sabbath law here as one of the most symbolically important laws, this isn't just about the Sabbath. This is Jesus' approach to faithfully applying God's law across the board, always seeing it through the lens of God's love for people. See, where the Pharisees would interpret Scripture in a vacuum and then figure out the rules and drop those rules onto people, Jesus took each person's situation to Scripture. Is the purpose of the Sabbath law to cause this man to suffer? No. It was to honor God and give rest. And that focus on spirit over letter got him accused of throwing out the Scriptures. But Jesus said he came not to abolish the law, but to fulfill it, something Christians understand in light of his death and resurrection. And that affects our relationship with the law to this day. Now, Jesus claims authority on this particular point as Lord of the Sabbath, but he also goes further than that, suggesting that even the legalistic Pharisees should have known to approach the scriptures this way. Because, as he points out, even in the Old Testament, God says, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Now, let me be clear, that's not to say that Christians aren't ever called to sacrifice. I mean, you know, we don't do burnt offerings anymore, but we are all called to go and sin no more. And that often means sacrificing what we want for what God calls us to. But sacrifice for its own sake isn't God's goal. And we have to be careful because it is way too easy to ask other people to sacrifice something that you don't believe you are being called to sacrifice. 
And that's what legalism often does. A legalistic approach says the letter of the law is more important than how it affects people. It says, let the child sit in the well overnight. The Sabbath law requires it. Let the man with the withered hand grin and bear it in obedience to the rule. Let the slaves sacrifice and serve, even if it seems unfair. God allowed the slavery, not me, so who am I to outlaw it? Let the LGBT folks suffer alone for the kingdom. God said it, not me. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. This was the Pharisees' approach. And Jesus said about it, They tie up heavy burdens and lay them on people's shoulders, but they will not lift a finger to move them. Which, honestly, is how a lot of LGBT people feel about the church right now. But Jesus' approach was different. You know, like the Pharisees, Jesus wanted people to live holy lives. But for Jesus, it was never about rules for the sake of rules. It was always about God's love for people. And when following the letter of the law got in the way of God's love for people, it was God's love, the spirit of the law, that won out for Jesus every time. Yes, the letter says no work on the Sabbath, but the spirit says God loves this man too much for me to pass him by. Yes, the letter allowed for slavery in a culture where it was commonplace, but the spirit demands freedom and equality for all people because they are beloved by God. Yes, the letter condemned examples of same-sex sex in contexts where, frankly, it made sense to do so. But now there are new opportunities for people to pursue love who couldn't have before. And so the Spirit is moving many Christians to say, you know, let's take a closer, more nuanced look at this question. And let's pay attention to the fruit that we're seeing in those lives. Because Jesus said that good trees bear good fruit, and bad trees bear bad fruit. So. When we see a lot of bad fruit and misery being borne by the church's old way of handling this question, so many stories of depression, loneliness, pain, broken families, people losing their faith, and then we see gay and bi people finally able to marry the person they love and live out their lives together, supporting and encouraging one another, and we see so many examples of good fruit being born in these relationships over and over again, you know what? I think we're right as Christians to put the spirit over the letter, to say the point of these passages wasn't to make people suffer, and to support this good fruit, knowing that God's love for people reigns supreme. And when we do that, I think that is the right interpretation of Scripture, following in the footsteps of Jesus. And if you disagree with me, okay, let's talk. But let's have a nuanced conversation. One that goes beyond sex to talk about the real lives and vocations of LGBT people. Okay, there's lots more to this conversation than I can fit in one video. If you'd like to learn more about this subject, as I said, I've written a book called Torn, Rescuing the Gospel from the Gays versus Christians Debate. It's filled with stories of how this debate is affecting real people and ways you can make a difference, whether you agree with my biblical analysis or not. It's available in print, ebook, and audiobook formats. I've got lots more videos like this on the way, so if you'd like to see them, you know what to do. Like, subscribe, and click that little bell. And if you'd like to help me make more videos like this, you can go here to support my Patreon, where you can unlock rewards and bonus videos just by being a patron. Finally, if you have feedback or questions, and I know you do, let's continue the conversation on my website at geekyjustin.com. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.